All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of the Global Reality, right here on the Global Reality Radio Network with me, your host, Josh Reeves. Thank you very much for being with us here tonight for another edition of the broadcast. We are going to be getting into a few different items of discussion here on the program tonight, as we always do. You never know where it's going to go. You never know what we're going to get into, and that's one of the that's one of the fun things about it. Never know where the conversation is going to go. And uh, we love getting emails from you. It's always fun to have stuff we can read on air and have people respond back to. We had some of those last night for sure. And uh, it's it's very. I, I really like hearing these some of these stories, these emails that we get from people. Especially ones like uh, we had last night. You know, just just hearing, you know, when you hear people have actual experiences with these things that we talk about, you know, like the gentleman last night. Or the co-worker, you know, and the, the whole Mason thing and birthday being on 9-11 and all that. Yeah, it is. It's a very interesting thing to. Uh, like I said, to see that and experience that actually happening out into the world. You know, I've been having this weird overdriving problem lately. Everything was been has been overdriven, and now I know why. There was a knob that got pushed up too hot. That's why we've been getting that overdriven. So I was wondering about that. That actually could have been what was causing the problem with the uh, audio stream the other night. Was the uh over yeah, because I kept adjusting this. Never, nothing was overdriven on this end, but on the software end, there was a knob on the uh, interface that was turned up. Must have got pushed uh, by accident or something. There we go. Uh, that's much better. I, I kept hearing something was sound like it was overdriving, and I was turning it down back here on the board, and it sounded like it was too hot on the microphone, and I'm way back from it. I didn't know what that was. Well, that explains that. All right. There we go. That sounds a little better. Not so overdrive. I knew something was sounding overdriving and in distortion. It's, you can always hear it. You shouldn't do that. You, you know, it's crazy. You want that if you're, you know, if you're doing analog recording, but you, you actually want that. You actually want it to saturate the tape so you can get that sound, but it's the polar opposite of that in digital recording. You do not want that whatsoever. In any case, there is no no good case scenario for distortion at all in any kind of digital recording because it just it doesn't saturate. There's no tape to saturate, so it doesn't give you any uh, good after effects. It gives you nothing but the bad clicks and pops and digital harsh crackle sound. It's ugh. It's terrible. So hopefully that will uh, fix that issue there. Sounds sounds to me like it's more crystal clear than it was. But that's, uh, you know, we're still sort of working out the kinks as we're getting back and up and rolling here. My website is theglobalreality.com. That's theglobalreality.com. And um, right out of the gates tonight, folks, we are in the uh, we're in the red alert situation now. We have to get the uh, operating costs paid today. We have no time left for this. Today's the last day we can do this. So please go there to theglobalreality.com. On the right hand side of the page, there is a banner there that says Global Reality June 2015 monthly operating cost goal. Please go there, make your contribution. We have about four hundred dollars left or so, somewhere, give or take. Uh, and we've got to have all of that in here in uh, uh, today. I mean, with before the end of the day on Wednesday. So please go, if you haven't contributed, uh, you know, if you're hearing this later and you think it's too late, hey, we need to reach, it would be even better if we got past our limit, but just go and contribute whatever you can. It doesn't matter if it's too little. Uh, you know, 
don't worry about that. Five dollars helps, twenty dollars helps, a hundred dollars, whatever you can spare. Just go there, make a contribution now. Or otherwise, we're going to be off the air. This is going to be it. This is going to be the last show we're going to be able to do. Uh, because again, just like always, we have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people listening, and we've had a, only two or three people contribute, and that's just not going to get it done. And that's what's allowing us to be able to provide the broadcasting on this free and we just got this off the ground we want do you want to see this fail before it even gets a chance to even grow you know i'm I'm trying to make this um into something that's better than it used to be here then we just started we've only you know it took me half the month to get it up off the ground well now we've got it wrong there's still some bugs here and there you know we're still working out kinks but we're up and running, and for the most part, everything's sounding good, and we want to continue to do that. But we have to have everybody's help, and we have to have... There's not anybody out there uh, whose help isn't needed. We need everyone's help. So, again, go to my website, make a contribution now. We are in a red alert situation. we got to have this. Uh, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be game over, so... We're past the point of playing around time. We need your help right now. Not tomorrow, not Friday, right now. Please go and help us. TheGlobalReality.com You can also find this uh, uh, campaign page for this at our Global Reality Facebook page, the Global Reality Radio Network Facebook page. If, you, if you're not a, a, a fan, if you haven't liked us over there, Please go and do that. We post all shows and uh, important vital things on there. You can also find the link to that page by scrolling down to the bottom of my website, theglobalreality.com. Everybody who donates $100 is going to get a $100 prize pack. If somebody comes in at $400, they are going to get $400 worth of uh, stuff for me in a special prize pack. And the, the uh, if you come in at the $400 level, you will get a prize pack that will include a real, actual, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, I'll only because I want it to be a surprise, but it, it, you will get, in, as a part of this prize pack, a real, actual artifact. An actual artifact that actually came from an ancient site. I have lots of things I have procured on my journey, so... Uh, everybody comes in at the $100 level is going to get uh, a nice prize pack. Just make sure if you donate 100 that you uh, send me an email with your address and all that stuff so I can get your stuff sent out to you. Um, and I'll get it sent out to you as soon as we uh, get everything else covered and i got enough left to pay for the postage and all that stuff. But um, please go there to our website, hit up our uh, Go Get Funding Global, Global Reality June 2015 monthly operating cost goal. And uh, I'm telling you, you want to get yourself one of these prize packs. You guys are going to get some cool stuff. And uh, it's going to be really kind of, you, it's going to be all hand selected stuff. I mean, it's going to be kind of random. It'll be a mixture of things. Uh, and it probably won't be what you're expecting it to be either. But it'll be it'll be definitely worth your contribution, that's for sure. It'll be it'll it'll be definitely worth that. So a hundred dollars that'll get you uh a hundred the hundred dollar prize gift pack, and if you donate four hundred dollars or, or more than that, it'll you know, it'll get bigger the more you contribute for sure. You know, you want to do eight hundred? Well, I'll set you up with an eight hundred dollar prize pack, whatever it may be. But uh Please help us get in there. We'll get some prize packs out to people. We're going to start doing that every month and having uh, prize packs for certain amounts that go along with our uh, monthly goals. And we'll have stuff like, you know, rare crystals and gems and jewelry. We'll have artifacts and, and all kinds of stuff, you know. It's going to be really awesome. So please contribute now so we can keep this going. I want to continue to do all the awesome stuff that we have planned here. And not only that, I have to continue to get to work on my Spellcasters film, which is 
my main focus right now, but it becomes harder and harder to focus on that. It's taking me longer to do it because I, uh, been doing the radio show thing. I'll probably get to the point. I'm not quite there yet, but I'll probably get to the point. I, I usually do this every time I make a film. I'll probably get to the point where eventually when I start making, getting more into the uh, editing element of the film, I'll probably at some point take one week off from doing the show and I do any shows for one week and do nothing but work on the film. Because every time I do that, when I'm working on a film, it, I get so far ahead that then it's just uh, all downhill after that. It's very easy to maintain after, you know, just taking a solid week off and working on nothing but the film. But it's very difficult to juggle both because it's two different mindsets. It's two different... Um, it's hard to describe. It's almost like two different body uh, states of being, almost. It's, it's really difficult to describe. Two different heads, head spaces, and it requires two different types of, you know, of energy from your body to do it. It's very difficult to describe. Uh, cause there's, you know, there's a definite process to it. So that's where we're at. And, uh, we, uh, I, I really don't have anything else to say other than, you know, it speaks for itself. We gotta, we gotta reach our full goal there, uh, at the website to cover the cost of stuff. And if we don't, that's going to be it. So all you people out there who have listened on YouTube, who've been listening. I mean, that's the thing I have analytics now and it's funny. I'll post a link to the 32 K podcast or something on Facebook and I won't post it anywhere else. Right. That way I know where all the views are coming in from. And it's funny that people, especially around this time when we, when we have to cover operating costs, that's when you'll notice that people liking your thing just drop off the map. When it's not around the first of the month, people don't, you, they, people, uh, they'll like your stuff all day long. But when it comes to that time, they don't like it. So they, because of what they do, they don't want you, they don't, they don't want to uh, acknowledge to you that they're listening. So you can't identify them. And that's not working anymore because I'll put it out on Facebook and it'll be the only place it's out at. And then I'll go and check the stats and notice, oh, well, you know, we've had 30 downloads the first five minutes we put it online, but no one has bothered to like it on Facebook and no one's bothered to contribute. It sinks like that, you know, and then we look at our uh, numbers on YouTube. I mean, the most recent videos I put up. From this week's show, I mean, we had almost 300 hits in less than 24 hours. So, you know, three or four or 500 people can listen to one of these shows in the first day or two that they're posted. But we can't get those same 500 people to donate a dollar each. Or $10 each or, or anything at all for that matter. We are not mainstream media. We do not have advertising. We do not have the fucking backing of major corporations. There is no one backing this operation except people out there who want something of their own. That's what we need. I understand that you've been conditioned and grown up, you know, for to hear people talk about stuff or news reporting and stuff like that, and it's been free your whole life, but you didn't realize that what the cost truly was. And who was really paying for that? So we need somebody to help out. We need people to help out. Everybody. I mean, give me a break. There, there's not there's not four people out there that can donate a hundred dollars each. There are eight people out there that can donate fifty dollars each. Give me a break. Come on, let's do this. Well, this is. Uh, let's get into the news. This is this is something I've been talking about for years. I've been telling people this was coming. I've even said many times here on the show 
that I believe this is already going on now. And this is absolute, absolute confirmation of this. And it reminds me of how back in, what was it, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there when uh, Obama started going in front of the press and saying that we needed to deploy geoengineering strategies and use things like airplanes emitting particulate matter into the atmosphere to create shielding against global warming. Chemtrails. When it had already been going on for decades. You know, I was sitting there, I remember reading those stories on the show, even when we were in our early days, saying, need to start doing it. You know, this has been going on for years and years and years. Same thing here. I've talked many times about how they uh, have terraformed I believe that the terraforming of Mars is going on right now and has been going on for quite some time. And there's been a website out there for many, many years called Red Colony. Redcolony.com. It's been there for years, and these guys have been openly for at least 10 years with on their website. Uh, they have all the science on, on how to do it. Now, whether the elite are building themselves a, an off-world base or, or whatever it may be, that's up in the air, but it, it definitely is a real thing now. This is an admission. Could we turn Mars into Earth 2.0? DARPA is working on designer organisms to terraform the red planet. Again, this is uh, just like the chemtrail thing. Oh, we sh maybe we should spray particulate matter with airplanes into the atmosphere to sh create a shield to protect us from the sun rays and climate change. Yeah, brilliant plan, Obama. We've been doing that shit for decades. But they act to the public like it's something we, we should do instead of something we've already been doing. This is something they, they often do in any black operations and stuff like that. They'll, you know, they'll launch wars before they've declared them to the public. Modifying a planet's atmosphere to make it habitable for humans could soon be a possibility, according to the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA has announced it is developing terraforming technology in a bid to recreate the conditions needed for life to thrive. It would see a number of organisms introduced to the Martian environment, making regions on the surface suitable for humans. Alicia Jackson, the deputy director of DARPA's Biological Technologies Office in Virginia, made comments alluding to the technology at a biotech conference on Monday. So again, they're, this is something that they're now acting like, oh, we, maybe we should do this, because this is a way they're slowly acclimating the public uh, to the fact that they already have been doing this. And I think the real story here is, is uh, the real question, here is, is why. Do they know of some extinction level event? They're trying to do this to, to uh, in preparation to move humans there, to recolonize on Mars. You know, do they know something's coming or doing because of that? Or, you know, what are the reasons? We could really sit around and speculate on this all day. I mentioned the movie, uh, the other night I mentioned the movie a Jupiter Ascending. And if you haven't seen that movie, it's definitely worth watching because it's just chock full of Anunnaki insinuating something. These, these, I mean, they're basically, you know, they're like Nephilim. They're, they're like humans with wings, and there are ones that are among them that are reptiles, and there are ones that are like their underlings that are like greys. And, you know, these are like immortal or not really immortal, but they're, you know, these royal, long life living people who set up planets to harvest humans, you know, to create their life extending juice. But there was something in there and it blew my mind because it's something that I remember getting laughed at about when I first talked about it. But it's something I found through my research and it's, it's a definite, uh, idea of mine, I think that uh, 
and I've said this many times on the show, people who've been listening for quite some time will know that I've said that whoever these um, people were, whether we call them the Anunnaki or whatever we call them, that were here prior to the flood and then after, I've said for years that I believe it's a possibility, in just judging from reading the text and everything else, that they terraformed Earth during the time of the dinosaurs to make it habitable for humans. And, and of course, they, uh, they, they talk about that, that the, these Anunnaki type of extraterrestrials in this movie, Jupiter Ascending, that's, they do exa- did exactly that. They terraformed Earth. And, uh, again, they, they hint at these things again and again, just like we talked about on the last program with the artificial intelligence stuff. You know, why, there's a reason why they continue to make all these Terminator movies. There's new, another new Terminator movie out right now. They've been coming out with these for years. Um, movies like Ex Machina, which just came out, too. There, there's tons. Uh, there was one, I guess, last year, the year before, what was it, Tr- Transcendence, Johnny Depp. Um, all the movies, even the comic book movies, like uh, uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron, you know, uh, with the character Vision, artificial intelligence, it's just it's being pumped down our throats constantly, and because it's because they're trying to prepare us for this stuff and prepare us for things that are, I, I think, in many ways, already foregone conclusions. It's almost like we're uh, we're, we're really just following a script that was already written that we're destined to follow. And I think a lot of this stuff that we argue about and a lot of the stuff that we ponder when it comes to this work falls under that, that category, you know, of, of the self-created, self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. Because nobody's stopping this. The, the train's already left the station. Everybody is already full aware of the consequences of creating artificially intelligent robots and computers and everything else. Eventually, no matter how many fail-safes or any sort of uh, protections we take, ultimately eventually our creations are going to turn on us. Especially if they become intelligent. I watched that movie, uh, Ex Machina. It, you know, I thought it was all right. I heard it was all oh, so good and such a good movie. And it's just one of those I thought was, uh, it was just really weird until I didn't know where they were going with it until it was over. Still don't really know where they were going with it other than I won't ruin it for you if you haven't seen it, but um, well, just the idea that you know the perfect AI would have all the all the characteristics that human have, you know, the ability to, you know, sex as a weapon and manipulation through, you know, um, emotions and stuff like that. But I mean, we're 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 not really we're not doing anything to stop this from happening. That's that's why when I see them continue to make movies about this and continue to 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 be somewhat like if if their point of making all these movies was to warn us to maybe uh, put the brakes on technology a little bit, if that was their point of of funding all these movies you would think that they would have stopped this a long time ago. Because obviously, it hasn't worked. At this point, they can make a million movies about how technology is going to, you know, take over and kill us all, and it's not going to stop it. So why do they keep making it? If that's already a foregone conclusion... You know, why do they, it just, it doesn't make sense. And I think that that's the whole reason why they continue to make them is because that it's, that's just this sick moral code that these elite people have. 
they love to admit things without coming out and admitting it. It's some kind of strange moral code. That way that, you know, they just like it's not on their conscience or something that they didn't, well, we didn't come right out and say it, but, you know, we made 20,000 movies telling you what that, what that was going to be like and what would happen. But the fact of the matter is we're doing nothing in any way, shape, or form to try and slow this down. And in fact, it, we, we take more and more steps every day to ensure that it does happen. And as I've talked about many times with transhumanism and um, you know technological apocalypse and this whole thing, I think that the reason why we're seeing these, all these movies coming out right now in combination with things like what's going on with the divide and conquer stuff concerning rebel flags and, you know, gay marriage and the rest of this stuff, the divide and conquer surrounding that. I think that um, it all really, if you want to get down to it, it really, the core issue of all of that stuff whether it be, you know, the, the dichotomy and the, the thing of humans merging with machines or, or technology taking over and destroying humanity or, you know, the rebel flag or the gays and gay marriage. At the end of the day, folks, all this stuff boils down to one thing and one thing alone. And that is the absolute disillusion and homogenization of individuality. That's the war. That's the war that's been declared on all of us. If you want to get down to it, they want to do away with individuality, period, into story. I mean, Huxley and um, H.G. Wells and these guys could never have dreamed up in their wildest, wettest dreams what is being actually unleashed on us non-fictionally. I mean, 1984 and Big Brother is nothing compared to this. It's the absolute, they want the absolute dissolution of all individuality. The dissolution of gender. Making there be no division between male and that's, that's a big part of it. Whether you want to believe it is or not, it absolutely is. Trying to do away with, with history and, and certain people, what certain people believe to be their heritage, you know, people from the South and whatnot, all that stuff. And the, and the merging with machines and humans becoming part human, part machine is a huge, massive part of that. Because that is the ultimate way. They can sell us on willfully destroying permanently humankind and humans themselves own individuality. And that is, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, the biggest threat to the state is always individuality. The individual always has more power than the mob or the, you know, the group mindset because it always creates divisions and hierarchies and those always ultimately get tumbled but the individual the individual is the one that has the power the person who can't be bought the person who can't be goaded or brainwashed into picking a phony side in a controlled Don King like fight Doesn't matter who wins, because I own both sides. I own both fighters. You boys have a good fight. Don't matter either way. I'm going home and getting my dick sucked in the cab. That's it. And that's how these guys that run the planet see it, too. Hey, don't give a fuck. I mean, you know, you all know that shit. The Rothschilds, all these guys funding both sides of every war since the American Civil War. Give me a break. And make a fuck to them who wins or loses, because in the end, they're going to be they're going to be all right. They're going to make out. Because they control. The casino, the house always wins. It's 
So don't forget it. That's what this is all really about. This is all really about the stripping away of, of individualism and the creation of a homogenized people where everybody thinks the same, acts the same, likes the same stuff. And the technology stuff is, is all a part of that. U.S. Air Force's most sophisticated stealth jet is beaten in a dogfight by plane from the 1970s, despite being the most expensive weapon in history. Yeah, the, 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 the pilot uh, who flew this thing said he wouldn't suggest that you fought in any sort of dogfighting scenario with any aircraft whatsoever within the visual range of your aircraft. Now, why is it that we have F-16 fighter jets 40 plus years old and we can't match that technology today with all of our best technology and, and everything else that we have? Why is it that we couldn't get a rocket off the ground in the United States until we brought all the Nazis over here to head up NASA during Project Paperclip, and all of a sudden we, you know, we go from can't get a rocket off the ground to have one hundred percent success rate, and then once all those guys die off, all of a sudden we don't have a space program anymore. Obama says, "Oh, we can't go back to the moon ever. We can't, we, we can't make it there. We don't even have a space shuttle anymore. Well, not a public one anyway. We always have the two separate space programs always operating." secret one and the public one. Just like there's a public government and a private government that nobody knows about, no, even, no, nobody elects, nobody knows who, was, who the members are. And, you know, the, you, the, think about this. You, look at the U-2 spy plane. I, I've watched multiple documentaries and stuff on the U-2 spy plane because they still use the U-2 spy plane. We've got every kind of drone and satellite and everything, but yet this 50 fucking something, you know, 60 year old fucking spy plane, we still use because they say, quote, there is technology that's in those planes we can't replicate today. And the U 2 spy plane was the first aircraft that was directly designed based on back engineered extraterrestrial recovered technology. That's a fact. And then what, what do we follow that up with just a few years later? Less than 10 years later. Less than 10 years later, what do we follow up the U-2 spy plane with? The SR-71 Blackbird. If you don't know what the SR-71 Blackbird is, look it up. And then go look up the year that it was made. It's unbelievable. That thing was made in like 1955. They tried to retire those multiple times they keep having to bring them out for the same exact reasons there's they, they keep saying the same thing there's still there's technology in the sr-71 blackbird we can't duplicate today i'll tell you what that tells me that tells me that they haven't got any new technology because essentially they have ran the course on the, the stuff that they back engineered and they haven't had, got any new blood in here because our space-based weapons we got from that same technology have been shooting down the UFOs before they even make it into the atmosphere. So there's nothing to recover. But think about that. So, I mean, it's not just the space program and the rockets and whatnot, but now it's, you know, it's the airplanes. Biggest budgets ever in the history of warfare at the disposal of these weapons makers, and they can't match 40-year-old technology. We had every bit of technology to go to the moon in 1969, but yet we can't go back there in the modern day. We don't have the technology to do it now. Somebody's not telling us the whole story, obviously. And of course, we know why that is. They never went in the first place, but... 
That's not the point. The point is, either the people who originally packaged and near this stuff have died off, and it was so secret they couldn't have anyone come up underneath them to take them or you know or take their place or whatever. I don't know, but there's something that definitely is going on with that because the only reliable technology that we seem to be able to have is the stuff that was made directly in the period after 1947 when we started to have technology recovered and back engineered. I mean, there's, there's no... I've found so much of this stuff just in my different research of these films. It's no secret why they brought the wreckage from um, Roswell to Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth right here outside Dallas. And then a short time later after that, they engineer the first silicone transistor from technology recovered in this downed UFO crash. And just a few miles away in Dallas, Texas Instruments, just right after this happens, creates here the first silicone transistor. That's admitted to. I mean, that, they did that because it crashed on the 33rd degree parallel near Roswell. And this location was also on the 33rd degree parallel. And, of course, that's, that ties in with the whole reason why they offed Kennedy here. Because Kennedy was supposedly coming to Dallas that day to admit the existence of extraterrestrials to the public. And he was going to do it here because... Of a variety of reasons. One, they uh, took the recovered crash stuff to to Dallas. I mean, to Fort Worth, and then supposedly also because of stuff they had found as they were building the new uh, Lake Rehubbard Reservoir near Rockwall, and they started digging out stuff there. And they that's when they cracked these. This would have been right next to the uh, not within the rock wall, but right in front of it when they were building this. Uh, Lake Rehubbard Reservoir, which, by the way, they ended up covering part of the rock wall with when they built it. Uh, my grandfather used to tell me stories when I was like five years old. I can remember going out on jet boats with my uh, aunt and uncle and my grandpa when I was four or five years old. And I can remember when I was like five years old being out on that lake and my grandfather telling me this story. I can remember it to this day saying, Josh, did you know that when they built this lake, I, to this day I can't recall why he told me this, but it's probably one of the key, it's definitely one of the key things that led me to finding out about the rock wall. And I learned it when I was five years old. And my grandfather said, did you know when they built this lake that they weren't able to get the tractors and the digging equipment out of here before it filled up with water? And all that machinery is still down there under the water right where we're at to this day. And that blew my mind, you know, five years ago, whoa, really? That's crazy. They just left it down there? You know, why didn't they, why didn't they get it? And, you know, he didn't, ever, he didn't really know what to tell me. And, of course, you can imagine my shock when I found out that when they were excavating the area, which was a, a very old, old forest, uh, right next to where the rock wall is. I mean, we were talking within, you know, 150, 150 yards or something. And when they were digging this thing out, they cracked what were described as a rock-lined dome uh, enclosure in the ground that went down under, this was, you know, ground level, went down to the ground really far and deep. And they cracked one of these and a guy's caterpillar digger fell off in there, and he jumped off just in time before the thing fell off into this rock line dome uh, cavern. We don't know what this is. I mean, this is, we're talking, I mean, it's right in front of where the rock wall is. We don't know whether this is an entrance to some underground subterranean chamber or a separate part or even a separate structure from the rock wall, but whatever it was, my grandfather heard about it and heard stories about new people talking about it because they didn't live too far, you know, from where Rockwell was. So he had heard, you know, obviously he'd heard somebody talking about it, was in the, you know, was in the news or something, but he knew about those 
you know, them cracking some kind of rock dome thing and then falling out, falling down there. And then when I found out about that years later, I went, oh my gosh. And the, the guy, I even found a news report where the, the guy who had this uh, backhoe or whatever it was, he had just, it was brand new. He had just bought it. He paid like 150 grand for it, you know, 1963 dollars or whatever. And um, for whatever reason, and they said they never gave him what he felt was an appropriate reason for why he couldn't recover it, but they absolutely told him he could not recover it. They had to leave it down there. And um, the other stuff I found says that, that they found another one of these. But I think they found some, I think they found something in there. Whether it was a subterranean chamber of, of giant skeletons or something, I don't know. But here's the thing. Whatever they found, they were, they were two and a half years behind schedule building that lake just a few months before Kennedy was assassinated here in Dallas. They crack that rock line dome thing. The tractors fall down in there. Two months later, Kennedy comes to Dallas, supposedly to talk about some of this extraterrestrial stuff, gets, gets his head blown off. And then by March of the next year, by March of, of 1964, just four months after Kennedy's assassination, all of a sudden they, right after he's killed, they, for, for whatever reason, put a rush job on that lake. So they go from being two and a half years behind its construction to having a rush job on it and being done just a few months after Kennedy's assassination. And that was the story, was that that lake was built there to cover up what was discovered whenever they uh, were building it out. And I'll tell you, it's crazy. I mean, for this to be, a, you know, usually when you have man-made lakes, they usually don't have crazy depth. But I remember going out there with my dad when I was a kid, and my dad would be like, my dad would always take, you know, long anchors and what he'd build. You know, you can drop an anchor down 130 feet in places in this motherfucker, and you wouldn't even hit bottom. 130 feet, dude. I mean, this is just a freshwater reservoir built for public water supply, you know? But there are, because it was built on such um, old stuff and who knows what's down there. Uh, it, but the, you know, the conditions are just too murky to go scuba diving and whatnot, but they know that. And actually, there's an old, their old town of Rockwall, the original settlement of Rockwall was on the uh, the, tr the banks of the Trinity River, and this was actually where parts of the Rockwall were originally uh, discovered. And uh, when they built the dam at Lake Levon, which is another nearby lake, they moved uh, the town farther up into where the current city of, of Rockwall is now, and then they flooded all that out. And I've heard from other rock wall researchers and other people who looked into this before me that um, in that old old town that was flooded out over there, there's supposedly some some more strange artifacts that may relate to the rock wall, like pyramid shaped stones and all kinds of crazy stuff. So this area you know, around here in Dallas, I'm, I'm finding out more and more. It's crazy. I mean, it's not just rock wall and it's not just doubt i mean there's all stuff around this whole area there's another city uh, it's in the suburbs out here flower mound and I remember my brother said hey you, have you ever looked into flower mounds like yeah i have it's crazy because they have um it's a giant giant fucking mound and i found you know yet again another clue in that that led me to believe it was built by the same people I've already been onto, because even if you go to their own website and read up about it, it uh, this mound sits at 666 feet exactly above sea level. That 666 is in, encoded numerically throughout mound structures within uh, the Ohio River Valley. And as I've stated before, and as I talked about in the Lost Secrets of Ancient America, Volume 2, this has to do with the 
um, Babylonian system of, of their numerical gods, how they enumerated their gods and the sun symbols and all that stuff, and the 60, base 60, sexagesimal numerical system. Well, right next to, right on the shores of this town, Flower Mound, where that's found, there's a lake, uh, Lake Grapevine, and it's, uh, it was created... And they covered up a bunch of stuff there, too. And before we had all this rain, before when, when the drought was still going on, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had to go out there and fence a bunch of stuff off because they started finding that all these ancient dinosaur prints and stuff were under this lake. Like, there was this big, giant ancient dinosaur site, and they just decided to build a lake on it and cover it up. Meanwhile, all around the shores of this lake, there's elevation changes out the wazoo, like a rock wall, you know. And there's another town right near both of those places, right near Grapevine, right near uh, Flower Mound, called South Lake. If you look up South Lake, it's known as the most affluent zip code in America. And it replaced Rockwall a couple of years ago as the richest county in Texas. And I've been over there a couple of times, and boy, it's, it's moundy as all get out over there. And it reminds me a lot of Rockwall as far as you can totally tell uh, there was ancient stuff here that they just built all this on. And it's unlike anywhere else in this whole metroplex of Dallas. There's nowhere else that's really like that. Except when you get in these outlying areas, and, of course, it being right there near the town of, of course, Flower Mountain. And these being the, you know, again, the two, you think it's a coincidence that the two most affluent and richest zip codes in the state of Texas are obviously built on top of ancient sites? Stuff they're trying to cover up. I mean, I'm in the heart of it here, man. I've traveled all over the country going to all these ancient sites and all this stuff. And really, to be honest with you, besides uh, the Ohio Valley, where the Newark Earthworks and all that stuff are there, it's, it's the same thing there. It's just, it's miles and miles of towns and cities and roads. And if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know that everything... That whole fucking state of Ohio is a goddamn mound. That's the thing I noticed when I went there. I was blown away. You're looking at the roads, and you see all these strange elevations, and you, you, you know, you realize there are mounds just for miles and miles and miles and miles, and you realize almost everything there is a fucking mound. It's, it's unbelievable, but I've never seen anything else like what is here in the outskirts of Dallas anywhere else except there. There's just nothing else like it. And they continue to cover this stuff up, act like it doesn't exist, trying to flush it into the garbage bins of history. And that's exactly why they want to take over this country, split it up into different factions, have the corporations come and take over. Because they know we're getting close to finally uncovering the real reason why this all, all stuff is here. And again, Fr Sir Francis Bacon, he wrote his book, The New Atlantis. If you haven't ever read that, you need to read it. He, he knew that they knew this was here. They knew that the Atlantis of old was built right here in the United States. And they knew ahead of time, this is where the, it was, it was like the self-fulfilling prophecy thing I talked about earlier. They knew that this is where it was going to happen again. And he even predicted that just like the Atlantis of old, we would reach a point where we would have to make a decision over which was more important, the survival of the species or power for the sake of more power. And, you know, we are indeed reaching that point yet again every day. So they've known it for years, and that's part of what worries me about all this divide and conquer and this attempt to foment race war. Because from the ancient religions to, the, you know, researching the priest class, as, I, as I've done for years, the one continuity thing that I've found through all of this is it seems that the elite have some desire or some goal to make things like, you know, the end of times, the end of days, uh, the fall of Atlantis, whatever. It just seems like they're like they somehow believe that it's their duty to ensure that these things happen again and or happen as they've been prophesized to occur almost as if their personal goal and lot in life is to ensure that this stuff happens and it's hard to think that if that is indeed the case 
that our planet isn't run by a truly evil and, dare I say, even, you know, demonic force. And it's stuff like this that, you know, I find more and more every day after I've been looking and after I've been researching this stuff for so many years, you start to uh, be able to consolidate and trim the fat and really get down to the real when you get into understanding, because it's a never-ending process of learning this stuff, and, and not just learning it, but truly understanding it and looking at all the angles. And that's the one thing I can say from my years of research into this stuff, is that the, the powers that be that run this planet seem to have an agenda to bring about some long ago predicted ending to our civilization as if that's their only reason for their existence and the only reason for any of our existence. Now, if this is, be if this is being done so that we can ascend up to a higher plane of existence in another planet in another dimension or something, all right, let's, you know, let's go for it. Fuck it. Let's kick off the apocalypse. Let's make this happen. But something tells me it's, this is only being done for whatever their own sick, evil, maniacal ends are. Boy, they're really ramping up the uh, terror threats for 4th of July weekend. There is the fear sauce is a pumping. FBI says there's no specific credible threats against the U.S., but Americans should be vigilant. It's the same horseshit they spouted before 9-11. You do realize that. Because it's just like if they knew a fucking meteor was going to crash into the planet tomorrow. What do you think will they get on the news and tell you? Hell no. Plausible deniability, baby. Even if they knew they wouldn't tell you. Because it's not in their benefit to tell people. It's in their benefit to not tell anybody shit. Same thing when it comes to these bullshit terror attacks and terror warnings. Now, they're, even if they knew beyond any shadow of a doubt where an attack was going to take place, would they tell you? Absolutely not. And it's not just about keeping everybody from panicking. It's about being able to control what they deem to be the positives from one of these events. And there was some stuff going around yesterday I saw about some Craigslist ad or something that supposedly got put on um, Craigslist in Houston where they were looking to pay crisis actors in Houston $200 a day to be crisis actors for some supposed drill of a terror attack happening in Houston somewhere between July 4th and July 6th, which is my birthday, by the way. Some are speculating that this is, uh, that they're planning some sort of terror event this Saturday in Houston under the guise of a drill, maybe a part of the Jade Helm thing, and uh, that will actually not be a drill, but be a real terror event, as they've done time and time again. You know, I... Uh, I don't ever... I don't get behind these things. and I mean, again, anything like this could happen any old day of the week. But for me, my thing about it is, the only reason I'm concerned with this at all is, for whatever reason, and we know probably what some of those reasons are. We talked about it last night. Texas is Texas stance on uh, everything from the gay marriage ruling to now wanting their gold back. I mean, they, they've they got my state and its people in the crosshairs, and there are a lot of good people here in this state, like myself and others, who uh, don't stand on either one of these sides. We're not on the phony left. We're not on the phony right. We're on the, the side of free humans, free individuals. And you know, a lot of people like that, like us, are going to get caught in the crosshairs of this stuff. 
the only way that they're going to be able to effectively dismantle the United States is if they put Texas and more specifically Texas gun owners well y'all wouldn't believe how many you know how many guns are in the state of Texas seriously I would dare say there's probably more guns in the state of Texas than there are anywhere else on the face of the fucking planet So I, you know, I don't get into the business of trying to predict terror attacks and stuff. And I, I would take anyone who predicts a terror attack with one hundred percent accuracy as an insider or a spook, if you will. No one has the ability to predict exactly on a day when one of these are going to happen. And anybody that ever says that they did is an absolute liar and, and a plant. Somebody who uh, had pre knowledge of this because they're an insider. But as I said, it does at least make me worry some, at least, you know, make me wonder if they may try something like this strictly because they've already got us here in Texas in their crosshair so much that this could be what they've been planning all along. I just don't know. But I feel the need to report it anyway. See what else we got here. Orthodox Jews hired Mexican laborers tra- to dress in traditional prayer garments and protest against New York Pride so young members wouldn't have to watch the parade themselves. Er, what? You gotta be fucking kidding me, right? It's got to be the onion or something. No, it's not. (laughs) Seriously? One man said they were paid by the Jewish Political Action Committee. JPAC? The Brooklyn organization claims the men were supplementary troops. So, (laughs) let me get this straight. These Orthodox Jews hired some me- some fucking Mexican illegal day laborers to dress up like Jews to go and protest the gay pride parade. Oh my God! Look at the oh. <laughs> Oh my fucking god, they got a picture. Oh, oh god damn, I'm gonna bust a gun. Oh. <laughs> oh my god. How come somebody had made a meme out of this shit? This is some of the goddamn funniest shit I've ever. Oh, this dude, oh, they got like, uh, okay, so they got like one dude in a fucking Nike hat with a vest. I mean, he looks like every fucking guy sitting out in front of Home Depot on Monday morning it's at 6 30 a.m. Uh, <laughs> he didn't look like he's a Jew at all. Second guy, uh, this guy looks like he got picked straight up off the fucking uh construction line at the gas station. Next guy, uh, he looks like the dark Mexican Jesus, and looks like he may lay hands on you at any moment. But the last guy, this guy on the on the right here. Oh my goodness. I can't tell whether that's a wig or they just did his hair like that. He looks like he's got some like curly Jewish hair and they put one of those like flat black, I don't know what you call them, those, you know, like the fucking uh, Hasidic Jews wear. (laughs) And this dude is so dark, he almost looks black. Oh my God. I don't know how. But see, I don't know how this is. If anybody else did this, if you and I did this, uh, they would equate us with fucking Nazis. They would equate us with Hitlers. But the Jews themselves do this. And this is like, I guess they're not even, I mean, nobody's even saying this is bad. There's no reports that they're coming down on them for doing this. They didn't want their own Jewish people to go see the gays. I mean, how much? That's like double hateful, isn't it? 
And that double racist, look how that's just double hateful. So we didn't want our, our precious Jew boys and girls to go see the gay the evil gays. So we hired a bunch of day laborers and dressed them up as Jews and sent them down with our JPAC signs, our Jewish Political Action Committee signs, and had them pose as Jews and hold up the signs at the gays so we wouldn't have to see the gays ourselves. I, <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. And yet people get labeled anti-Semitic and get blacklisted for saying things like Jews run Hollywood. When it's a fact, Jews run Hollywood. They created it from, from the bottom up. But they're not the only people that control it. That's, a, that's, the, that's the key thing. But the point is, I mean, this is, this is appalling. It's absolutely appalling. I mean, if you and I did something like this, it, it, <laughs> I mean, that's like hiring a bunch of fucking crackheads, going down and finding a bunch of meth heads at the trailer park and giving them some meth in $20 each to go and, you know, uh, act like they're KKK members or something. This is... I mean, can you say exploitation? This is just unbelievable. But again, it, you know, d nobody's really saying that this is this is bad. They're acting like this is a good thing. Revelers kissed openly in front of them and threw water bottles into their area to display their anger. At one point, they streamed into the labor's cordoned off area and started to fight with the group. Hershey Freed, or Heshi Freed, a member of the Jewish Political Action Committee said the Mexicans were supplementary troops filling in for the Jewish students. The rabbi said that the yeshiva boys shouldn't come out for this because of what they would see at the parade. Oh, what? It, well, that, that insinuates that they didn't want them to see it because they were afraid they'd like it. That's what that insinuates. That's the real truth here. Okay, I get it now. I see what's going on here. It took me a minute. Oh, I see. Okay. So you were afraid these boys were going to come down and see the gay guys out there flaunting their stuff and doing it freely out in the open, and they were going to be like, oh, I want me some of that action. The, the yeshiva boys shouldn't come out for this because of what they would see at the parade. It's been a lot of confrontation. Whenever you have emotions, you have a situation. One of the signs being held up at the, by the group was, quote, Judaism promotes, or I'm sorry, Judaism prohibits homosexuality. Does it? Does, does Judaism prohibit homosexuality? Because uh, I'm pretty sure that the liberal Jew-run media has been behind pushing all of this stuff. I'm pretty sure I've seen gay Jew people in my life. Oh, I forgot. They do that all in secret. They're kind of like the Catholics, aren't they? Damn dirty gays. Meanwhile, they're fucking smoking pole back in the back in the fucking confessional booth and everything else. Oh, God damn. It's funny, though. They didn't. Get, you should have gave them fake beards. If they would have given them fake beards, it would have been much better. These guys ain't got fake beard one. They got fucking Poncho and fucking Jose and Juan and Domingo over here. And these motherfuckers look like they're wearing the shit that they put around you at the barbershop so you don't get fucking hair on your shit when you're getting a cut. And they look like they straight up just came out of the Home Depot parking lot. Except again, this dude on the right with the hat and the fun, kind of funky look like they gave him, a, put some activator and gave him some jerry curl or some shit. And then his buddy, fucking Mexican Jesus over there next to him. Brown Jesus. Forget black Jesus. They got brown Jesus over there. Jesus. I'm sorry. Jesus. Let me get it right. <laughs> look at fucking Cool Mo D over there, though. <laughs> God damn. 
That is that that really seriously is the funniest shit. I've dated these guys. I mean, you know, you see those memes that say seems legit. That's what this needs on it. Seems legit, you know. Yeah, it seems legit. Some fucking, you know, they're they're brown. Who gives a fuck? Throw a white frock on them. Give them a fucking sign about Jews being against gays and slip a fucking Hasidic diamond salesman hat on this motherfucker and put some activator in his shit and get him get it done. We can't have our boys out there getting exposed to these gays running around with their cocks hanging out and fucking slobbing knobs around the street. Now they'll, they'll ask why they aren't out there allowed to do that and have that. Don't hire some day laborers to do it for us. That boy. That just speaks volumes, doesn't it? You know who I really hate? You know who? <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like, you know, it really grinds my gears, but no, <laughs> you know who I really fucking hate? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Have I gone off on that fucking cocksucker enough lately? I don't think I have. This guy, it, what a clown. It blows my mind that people have been so brainwashed by this guy's cult of personality that he puts out. I mean, what a fucking clown. This this guy has had the balls on numerous occasions to to claim that genetically modified foods are not bad for you. And that they're good. I bet this motherfucker ain't a, doesn't eat genetically modified food. I bet he eats five star, five hundred dollar plate dinners every night. And how do I know that? Well, because I know some people, and had some friends and new people you know, that actually paid money to go see this clown in person. He charges like I don't know three or four hundred dollars a seat. Dude, you ain't fucking Bon Jovi. Who the fuck do you think you are? You're not fucking Rush or fucking. You know, Neil Young or something. Uh, who the fuck has got $340 a pop? I'm in the wrong fucking business. I tell you what, uh, another guy does that, William Henry. I interviewed William Henry a few years ago. He does that same thing. He's been coming to Dallas a couple of times, and I want to go talk to him because I interviewed him and stuff. Boy, and it's not even worth it. $250 a seat to go see this guy. Fuck, fuck that. I mean, I may not like David Icke, but I went and saw David Icke fucking back in like 2009 in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that dude talks for like 12 fucking hours. Not even kidding you. You get there at like 10 a.m. and you're there till like fucking 8 at night. The dude talks for like 10 fucking hours and it was like 50 bucks. You know, which even at the time I thought was a little steep, but I mean, fuck, it's like 10 or 12 hours. But Neil deGrasse Tyson, he charges three or four hundred dollars. The guy is such a fucking scumbag gatekeeper. He makes up lies. He makes up quotes, makes up stuff off the top of his head, tells people GMO foods are good. And now this Neil deGrasse Tyson's message to people who think Pope Francis shouldn't talk about climate change. When Pope Francis released his encyclical on the environment earlier this month he faced some criticism from people who said religious leaders do not have the correct expertise to speak authoritatively about climate change acclaimed astrophysicist neil degrassi tyson is not one of those people on tuesday the author and host of the late night talk show star talk tweeted that despite being a religious figure pope francis is more than qualified to talk about scientific issues in a series of tweets tyson noted that the vatican observatory employs dozens of scientists who inform the pope on issues like climate change well here's the here's the thing number one this is the first time we've ever had a Jesuit Pope. So that's the game changer of the whole thing. The Jesuits and the, and the people of there who cut from their jib are not the same as the garden variety other Popes that they've ever had. Because they're the intellectual side of this. And yes, it's true that the Vatican <clears throat> uh, employs the world's top scientists. And yes, they have the world's biggest telescopes and the rest of this stuff. But for years, they've been using science and religion as a dogmatic sort of left versus right good guy versus bad guy feud and now all of a sudden in order to get their agendas achieved now and i've predicted this for years to be coming folks and here it is it's happening right now this is the real new world order happening right now the merging of the bullshit phony science and the merging of the bullshit phony religion into one universal ball of bullshit that everyone believes. And this is, do they're doing it in this fucking cocksucker. 
Neil deGrasse Tyson is a part of that. Because, you, you're, you know, the people that have said that are absolutely right. The, the, the Pope, for all intents and purposes, shouldn't be, should not be talking about climate change or anything that has to do with science because science is not his, it's not his arena. You are supposed to be in the arena of religion, so you should be sticking to that. Why has that changed all of a sudden? Is why is somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson backing him up? Because the Jesuits are the superior intellectual establishment on the planet. That's a fact. That's why Jesuit education, Jesuit trained individuals go on to such high level things in life. They are the intellectual heft behind world affairs. What the Rothschilds are to banking in the financial world, the Jesuits are to the intellectual side of things. They are the ones that cook up things like the plan to assassinate Kennedy or the plan of 9-11. They are the intellectual heft, and they are trained to believe that no matter what they do, no matter heinous, how heinous it may be, they are doing it in service of God, and therefore it's justified. And when you start to see that being merged with these bullshit, gatekeeping, pseudo-scientific liars like Neil deGrasse Tyson, folks, that's the biggest indicator that the stuff that people have been talking about for years, the New World Order, this, that, and the other, is here, and it's here right now, and this is a big indicator of this. They lie about the things that are bad. They try to, every, at every turn, they steer back towards whatever the current political narrative and belief structure is. And nothing that it, he, they ever say ever is outside of the box. It's always 100% in the agenda. And this is absolute proof of that. Unbelievable stuff. Article out of Time Magazine here. I'm not going to read this because it's it's too long, but you can go and, and uh, read it yourself. It's entitled, This is What World War III Will Look Like. And uh, it's interesting, when you read this article, the predominant thing that's talked about is exactly what I've been talking about for the longest time, and that is the use of space-based weapons. And what people have for years considered to be in the realm of science fiction really being the next frontier for warfare. And over the next 10 to 15 years, you're going to start to see this come into play in your lifetime. It's coming. A team of archaeologists have discovered mummified human remains that could be 2,000 years old at the site of a planned northwestern Indiana quarry. Oh, Indiana, man, that's jock full of stuff. Chalk full of mounds. There's actually another, another serpent mound in, in Indiana. There's tons of animal effigy mounds and other kinds of mounds in Indiana. And a lot of them, or most of them, are, are unexplored and off limits to the public. There are very few that are actually accessible to the public. Lots more that aren't than, than are. The Angel Mounds are in southwest, or south, uh, yeah, southwestern Indiana. We went there a couple of years ago. The team found the remains Friday on the site of a planned quarry southeast of Lowell, or about 20 miles south of Gary, Indiana. They're saying it could be 500 to 2,000 years old. They could distinguish a head and a torso. It could be a Native American burial ground. The archaeologists who found the remains had been hired by Cardinal Environmental Consultation Company to search for prehistoric artifacts at the site, which is required in order to get permits for such excavation projects. The sheriff's office and coroner's office were called out to the scene and quickly established the possible human remains were not part of a crime scene. The artifacts found at the scene have been determined by the Cardinal archaeologists at the scene to be possibly... Human remains, but the exact age is still unknown at this time. Farmers and residents in southern Lake County have opposed the quarry, which Indianapolis-based Reith Riley Construction Company intends to mine for a concrete aggregate that's used in road construction. The quarry also would be used as a giant retention pond to capture overflow from nearby Singleton Ditch. It's probably that whole site that they're wanting to do this quarry on it is probably an ancient archaeological site. And that's probably the whole reason why they want to build a quarry there is to 
cover an archaeological site. There's been several of those that have been discovered around Rockwall. Uh, a specific quarry where uh, an ancient meteorite was found right near where the rock wall is. And, and then uh, when I went out to check it out, it had been taken over and turned into a landfill. Keeping people out of there. Into the light, how LIDAR is replacing radar as the archaeologist map tool of choice. Boy, I wish we had the money to do that. That's what I want. I want LIDAR scans done of the rock wall. Because then we'd never even have to dig anything. With LIDAR, you can get, you know, full 3D images of everything underneath the ground, and then you put it together in a computer. You don't even have to dig anything. Colorado State University archaeologist Chris Fisher found out about LIDAR in 2009. He was surveying the ruins of Angamuco in west central Mexico the traditional way, with a line of grad students and assistants walking carefully while looking at the ground for bits of ceramics the remains of an old foundation, or even a tomb. He had expected to find a settlement, but instead he happened upon a major city of the Propecha Empire. Rivals of the Aztecs in the centuries immediately preceding the Spanish conquest of Mexico in 1519. The site covered 13 square kilometers. Traditional surveying would have taken years, so he turned to a technology that uses pulses of light to penetrate the forest and ground to reveal what lay beneath. In two seasons, we had surveyed only two square kilometers. But with this new technology, LIDAR, we mapped the entire city in 45 minutes. Yeah. See, that's what we need for Rockwall. God. And if there's anybody out there, I'm just going to put it out because I don't know. You never know if there's anybody out there that can help us be able to get some LIDAR scans done for Rockwall. Please let me know. Today, LIDAR, short for light detection and ranging, is a key archaeology tool that can detect not only buildings, but also the remains of roads, agricultural terraces, aqueducts, caves, fences, and even boundaries between ancient neighborhoods. Using hardware based on the ground or on an airplane, LIDAR can produce images in three dimensions. In the future, drones will probably do most of the surveys, besides Mexico, LIDAR has been used to penetrate forest canopy in many countries, in, among them Belize, Honduras, Guatemala, and Cambodia, where the vegetation had been too dense or too troublesome to allow for traditional methods. We've extended our LIDAR coverage by nearly 2,000 square kilometers, said archaeologist Damien Evans of the French School of Asian Studies. He is based in the ancient Cambodian city of Anger, where he is working as project supervisor. Yeah, they've been doing LIDAR there in Anger Wat for a while now. Even our first rough results are showing us things that people have never seen before. Yeah, because you can see, uh, even if there's, the thing about LiDAR is, even if there's structures and newly built stuff there, you can see past and through and under all of that. So none of that stuff hinders you. So things like, you know, parts of the rock wall being built on top of, and have newer structures built on top of it, won't even affect anything if you've got LiDAR. LiDAR will see right through that stuff. Boy, this is rich coming from the Smithsonian. First thing I saw when I saw this article was, yeah, they would know, wouldn't they? Fucking giant skeleton hiding motherfuckers they are. Ancient urns or drinking vessels for giants. Behind the mysterious plane of jars in Laos. Well, that's rich, isn't it? <coughs> the group single-handedly personally responsible for hiding the truth about giants more than anybody else. Insinuating these ancient giant jars in Laos may have been drinking vessels for giants. Well, that's rich. Stonehenge inspires awe, but there's an even more mysterious ancient site in Laos. The plain of jars consists of thousands of prehistoric stone vessels scattered over hundreds of square kilometers near Fonsavan in the northeastern part of the country. A hilly area despite the plane in the name. So there's mounds everywhere, of course. The huge jars form a surreal site. Some are up to 10 feet tall and weigh several tons. It's an archaeological wonder that experts still haven't pinned down. French archaeologists began puzzling over the vast display in the early 20th century. One Henri Paramentier 
who visited in 1923, found that although the contents of many of the jars had already been plundered, a typical one might contain one or two black pots, one or two hand axes, and a bizarre object, he concluded, was a lamp, glass beads, drilled carnelian beads, earrings of stone or glass, bronze bells, and frequently the debris of human bones. Probably cooking and eating fucking humans and giants were probably cooking and eating some fucking humans and the motherfuckers, what they were doing. Yet another French archaeologist, Madeleine Kalani, is credited with providing much of the early information about the Sinai for conducting field research. I just thought of something I wanted to mention. A few months ago, I got an email from a listener who said, Hey, if you've never seen this anime cartoon, uh, Attack on Titan, they were like, Oh, you got to check this out. They're like, this shit's right up your alley, man. It's right up your wheelhouse. It's like it's got stuff in it that, you know, is straight out of your research. And I started watching some of it. <laughs> I was cracking up laughing in the first episode or whatever it was that I watched. You know, ancient giant sleeping underground are awakened. And then humans live in small cities, in walled cities that look like just like the rock wall, by the way, to hide out from the giants. And then the giants awaken and start eating the, the humans, and the humans are living in these giant walled cities to protect themselves from the giants. I mean, <laughs> thank you, by the way, to whoever that was that pointed me in the direction of that. I could, I mean, you're right on with that. Start watching for five minutes. I was just, I mean, they just throw this stuff in our fucking face, man. They put it in cartoons, they put it in crap and act like it's just a joke, but they do that because they know it's real and they know that if they create the belief it's fiction and make cartoons as if to back up that fiction, nobody will ever believe it's true if any proof ever does come out about it. Archaeologists say that the structures, some of which date back 2,000 years, may be burial-related. The one-off reported local legend declares that, quote, a tribe of giants used them as wine chalices to celebrate a great victory. Well, that's usually where you find the most truth is in the ancient local legends that people will try to downplay and play off. It's been my experience traveling around the country that when you find those, that's usually where you find the closest truth at. This is usually the stuff that they try to write off as wive tales or Ancient tribal legends, those are usually the closest to the truth. The jars are mostly undecorated, but some feature carved human figures or faces. There are circular stone discs near the jars, thought to be lids, and these, according to UNESCO, are also sometimes carved with representations of humans, tigers, or monkeys. Similar creations exist elsewhere, including in a part of India 600 miles away, but it's still unclear exactly which civilization made the ones in Laos. More recently, UNESCO has classified the area as a tentative addition to the World Heritage List, important but not imperiled. Indeed, there's another layer of history aside from the ancient puzzle. In the 1960s and 1970s, during the Indochina War, American forces dropped more than 2 million tons of bombs on Laos, and the Plain of Jars area is still pocked with craters formed from these explosions. The region still includes unexploded bombs, landmines, and other unexploded weapons. And as the craters reveal, is, quote, one of the most heavily bombed places on the planet. Oh, God. Despite military attacks, the mysterious works have survived, and the Plain of Jars is still northeastern Laos's most popular tourist attraction. With visitors staying along carefully marked safety paths as they marvel at this ancient unsolved wonder. Another case, I didn't even know that. I've, I've, God, for years, I've been looking, you know, and searching doing, and doing research, trying to find um, any sort of ancient archaeological sites that they would have wanted destroyed to destroy during the Vietnam War. And there it is. I mean, it just fell in my lap with this little, you know, just a daily news article we cover here on the show. So that's proof right there. They were the most heavily bombed place on the planet. This place where these ancient giant 
goblets of the gods, goblets of giants are there. And there's still unexploded weapons around it, and you still can't... So that means that what they allow you to see is what they allow you to see, and probably not all that's there. Unbelievable. <laughs> that really explains that. All right, folks. That's going to do it for the show tonight. Again, we are at crunch time. Go to my website, theglobalreality.com. Hit up our Global Reality June 2015 monthly operating costs where you can use the donate button there if you want. Uh, we got to have at least $400 in here ASAP. Get yourself the prize pack. Anybody that donates $100 or more is going to get a prize pack. Whoever donates the most will get the biggest. So we don't have any time to waste. We got to have this ASAP. If you're hearing me talk about this, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, that means you need to donate immediately. My name is Josh Reeves. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you next time, hopefully, if we reach our goal. If we don't reach our goal today, um, that's it. We won't be back. So it's in your hands. Take care.